Well, today I will talk to you about the Chinese vaccines as a soft power tool in the post-coronavirus world we live in. And this is particularly important for China because it was impacted by this crisis to a great extent. And let's remind ourselves here that last year it was the epicenter of the crisis and the U.S. President Donald Trump at the time would call it the Chinese virus, in quotation marks. And so, yes, it was a health emergency to begin with, and uh, obviously a humanitarian crisis, first and foremost. But there is, uh, and there has always been a soft power element. There has always been a propaganda uh, element in this. Basically, the coronavirus crisis overlapped uh, with the increasing tensions between the United States uh, and China. Uh, so much so that that you know many, many scholars call this period uh, a new Cold War uh, between these uh, two great powers, uh, one superpower and one uh, emerging power. Therefore, uh, coronavirus crisis should be considered to be a soft power crisis uh, on on the part of China uh, from the beginning onwards, because the country's image was shattered. All the appeal that has gathered, you know, in the last uh, two decades or so, especially uh, on the developing world, uh, because at least since the 2008 global financial crisis, uh, we have indeed seen a rise in the scholarly uh, studies or the, the media, uh, you know, uh, broadcasts over terms uh, like, you know, Beijing consensus or, or China model. Uh, basically, this crisis uh, is something that has uh, affected uh, China, uh, especially in the initial uh, months at least, uh, in, in a very negative sense. So all that image of a growing country, emerging country, and the model uh, basically was shattered. And the global media's, of course, uh, perception and uh, broadcasts of, of the coronavirus crisis was sometimes very biased and uh, sometimes also took on, uh, you know, very general uh, concepts like, you know, culture, uh, Chinese culture at large. Uh, it has started, uh, you know, picking on uh, the wild animal markets, exotic animals, etc. Uh, but it has uh, basically moved on to the eating habits and the and questioning of the Chinese culture uh, at large. And uh, let's remind ourselves here, and for those who are unfamiliar with the term soft power, uh, this is a term devised by uh, Joseph uh, Nye uh, in the early 1990s. This is the immediate uh, post-Cold War uh, period. Uh, and not surprisingly, the term soft power, which basically uh, deals with the, uh, the charm aspect, the appealing aspect of, of a country rather than its economic capacity or uh, coercive uh, power. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, this basically had to do with uh, the American power and uh, concepts like, for instance, uh, Hollywood or pop music, uh, basically the, the charming aspects of uh, American power and not its uh, military capacity or uh, even the, the economic uh, power. Since the 1990s, we have basically seen this uh, concept uh, traveling to further geographies uh, and uh, emerging powers uh, from Brazil to Turkey, uh, from Indonesia to Russia, uh, have received uh, attention, scholarly attention in terms of uh, soft power. Uh, what are their uh, soft power appeals or whether or not uh, they have a soft power appeal, something like uh, the United States would represent. Uh, and in, in those studies, in the, in the scholarly uh, literature uh, addressing soft power topics, uh, we have seen China to be a, a very, very important topic uh, for anyone who is interested in soft power. Uh, China, with its miraculous economic growth since the 1980s or so, uh, double-digit economic growth rates uh, and uh, political stability as well, although it is, uh, you know, uh, it is not a democracy and uh, many, many authors and scholarly works argue that uh, the, the political aspect of or the policy aspect of uh, Chinese soft power is rather limited. Uh, there has been many uh, scholars who have been critical uh, of, of that potential. But uh, nevertheless, we have seen, especially since the 2008 
the financial crisis, we have seen a growing interest uh, in the China model, the Beijing consensus, uh, these terms like uh, an alternative model to the uh, Washington consensus, IMF and uh, Bretton Woods system represented by the, by the US or the Western hemisphere at large. Uh, I'm including in this uh, neoliberalism and uh, many other institutional aspects of you know, Western uh, predominance. Uh, so China began uh, getting uh, increasing attention uh, both from the public uh, and uh, media, media circles, and uh, the scholarly uh, community. So coronavirus basically, coronavirus crisis, which has started in China last year, shattered all this. Uh, the image, uh, at least in the initial uh, couple of months, uh, China has uh, seen its country image uh, very much damaged uh, with all these you know, large-scale quarantine measures, humanitarian aspect of the crisis, plus questions over transparency, reporting, and uh, the, the global media's attention uh, on the crisis, and uh, basically the association of the crisis and, and China's failure to, uh, you know, uh, to, to contain the crisis in the beginning, uh, the, the relationship of this failure with its political regime, this was like the highlight of the story. Uh, basically constituted uh, the, the headlines in uh, most uh, Western reporting. Uh, therefore, China had a problem. I mean, a, an image uh, problem that it had to fix. And, uh, you know, together with the containment of the crisis at home, containment of the health issue at home, uh, this we can remember with uh, slogans like, you know, zero. Uh, new cases or zero local cases because uh, after a while by the spring of uh, 2020 uh, all the cases in China began coming from abroad. Uh, there was no domestic cases anymore, only those who have traveled uh, abroad brought back uh, the, the COVID uh, virus uh, and uh, with intense measures etc, uh, the quarantine measures, uh, contract tracing etc, China was able to uh, contain this crisis. Now, of course, uh, about the soft power aspect, you, you uh, had in the beginning, in the spring of 2020, you had a health diplomacy uh, to go along with it. Uh, and initially, of course, it was the medical aid. Uh, it was China's uh, aid and assistance to developing countries or any country uh, therefore, basically handle, trying to handle this crisis. Uh, I mean, it could as well be uh, a developed country, a Western country like Italy, for instance, uh, the, the tragedies that, uh, you know, uh, that, that was in place in Italy back then. Uh, even European countries uh, needed uh, aid and assistance. And uh, China was there to, to come with uh, the, the medical aid, medical teams, uh, the booklets uh, that shared uh, in different languages with uh, different countries, uh, China's own experience uh, with the handling of the crisis. I'm talking about the medical uh, experience here, rather specialized knowledge, uh, the firsthand experience of doctors and nurses uh, with this crisis. Uh, so it all started with test kits, masks, uh, to an extent that this was called the mask diplomacy for a while. Uh, and, you know, China was already, you know, uh, making efforts. But it has, of course, this health diplomacy, uh, which is a very important, I would say, uh, part of the propaganda wars uh, in the post-COVID uh, environment. Uh, you know, health diplomacy together with uh, nowadays the vaccines. It is now called vaccine diplomacy in the global media, uh, maybe not as such in, in China. Uh, I mean, this is not a Chinese term, uh, but nevertheless, uh, vaccines seem to have replaced uh, test kits and uh, masks, uh, which uh, seem to dominate uh, the health uh, diplomacy and soft power tools uh, only a year ago. And now we have seen a couple of Chinese companies, state-owned companies, as well as private uh, Chinese companies, uh, to come up with vaccines to protect people 
from uh, getting infected, protect people from hospitalization and death, right? Uh, so we have indeed seen uh, a couple of these uh, vaccines uh, to be approved uh, for emergency use in several countries by now. Uh, and also in China, obviously, currently, uh, China is indeed uh, emphasizing giving much priority to its own domestic uh, vaccination efforts. But before that, uh, of course, we have seen these vaccines, Chinese vaccines, uh, they are usually called Chinese vaccines, although, uh, the, you know, the Western vaccines are usually called by their own brands. Uh, and uh, that would be a very, uh, you know, uh, big overgeneralization <laughs> uh, in that sense, uh, but uh, and the wrong overgeneralization, uh, maybe. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we are now using the term Chinese vaccine and vaccine diplomacy because it has become a rather, uh, you know, standard uh, usage, a standard scholarly, uh, you know, term. Uh, so we have seen all these Chinese vaccines uh, replacing test kits and masks. Uh, and uh, there are questions, obviously, uh, around the use of vaccines as soft power tools. How and why it, they could become soft power tools? Well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, in many countries today, including those in the Middle East, uh, and including I'm including in that group Turkey as well, we have indeed uh, this uh, image, uh, probably an older one, uh, something that remains uh, from the 1990s or so. Uh, we have this image of the Chinese goods as uh, cheap, fake, and uh, low quality. Okay, there are stereotypes around uh, China made products uh, and uh, a vaccine being a high end uh, technological product uh, is in itself uh, potentially very important in terms of bringing down uh, that stereotype. Right. I mean, if uh, you have a high quality vaccine, there is a chance that uh, people will uh, change their perceptions of uh, China-made goods. Uh, so in that sense, it, it may become uh, a soft power tool. Uh, another one, of course, is about the efficacy uh, of the vaccine. Uh, I mean, if these vaccines are safe and efficient, uh, they have the potential to save uh, millions of people in several uh, developing countries where you know, vaccines may be uh, you know, quite expensive products, right? I mean, it, not not that easy to uh, afford uh, for for many developing countries. Uh, so, if those vaccines, Chinese vaccines, are able to save uh, millions of people uh, from the yoke of this crisis, uh, that's another uh, soft power benefit uh, there, uh, because these people will probably be thankful and uh, they will appreciate. Uh, China uh, way more. And of course, in the larger surroundings of the post-coronavirus world, we also have the United States, right? Even before this crisis, you had the American-Chinese tension. And uh, the, the uh, initiatives like COAX and the World Health Organization, uh, I mean, those international multilateral settings uh, has always been an issue with the United States, right, uh, under the Trump administration. And the United States uh, has been uh, receiving uh, a lot of criticisms uh, with regard to its uh, so-called vaccine nationalism, the hoarding of vaccines and not letting, uh, letting the vaccines to be exported uh, to, to the countries in need, etc. cetera. Uh, so there is this self-centeredness with regard to uh, the U.S., Power, the American uh, power in the post-COVID uh, environment, and uh, in institutional frameworks such as World Health Organization, etc., uh, these have been uh, way more pronounced. And in that sense, uh, China's promoting of uh, of the vaccines, coronavirus vaccines, as public goods again in quotation marks, not that they are being exported without a charge. I mean, uh, not that they are being exported. Uh, only as humanitarian aid, free of charge, etc. Uh, but nevertheless, the discourse 
coming along with it. Uh, vaccines as public goods rather than uh, vaccines as, uh, as goods be profited uh, on, right? Uh, there is a big difference uh, in between. Therefore, uh, both in international politics and uh, in, in regional politics, in, in bilateral uh, diplomacy, vaccines may indeed uh, have uh, a lot of uh, sense in, in, in soft power terms. I mean, they can make a lot of sense uh, and they can indeed become beneficial. But that criteria, how much of that criteria has been met? Uh, I mean, uh, the price of the vaccine, efficacy of the vaccine, or, or needs uh, of the domestic uh, populations uh, in the Middle East or in several other uh, developing countries, uh, that seems to have, uh, I mean, currently, uh, that seems to have a rather mixed record. Uh, from the example of Turkey, I mean, the Turkish case study uh, that I'm uh, interested in, uh, we, can, we can basically say that, uh, you know, Chinese vaccine, the idea of the Chinese vaccine uh, was very, very hard to sell to the public. Uh, it's also, of course, it also has to do with uh, the public perceptions of China in that particular country before the coronavirus crisis, okay? Because the COVID crisis, already made, in most cases, already made a rather negative uh, impact on, on China's image, China's country brand, if you will. In, in the Western countries, the public surveys, for instance, conducted uh, in the United States and in uh, several Western European countries, tell us that uh, that image uh, took a nosedive. I mean, China's image indeed has suffered greatly in the post-coronavirus uh, uh, environment. Uh, but what happened to the Chinese image in countries, uh, for instance, where uh, China enjoyed a more favorable image, uh, such as Egypt, for instance. Uh, in, uh, in the Middle East, you have uh, several countries uh, that enjoyed a favorable uh, China image right, uh, before the coronavirus crisis. And uh, today, United Arab Emirates, for instance, and Egypt uh, stands uh, as countries uh, to be very, very uh, influential to, to come and play a very big role in China's vaccine diplomacy, it seems, because they have now been granted, uh, you know, uh, production licenses, etc. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, China is making inroads, uh, you know, in, in the Middle East. This is important because Chinese Middle Eastern relations uh, has generally been characterized along uh, oil diplomacy, along uh, as if it was exclusive to uh, the raw materials uh, and um, oil dealings, etc. Obviously, I mean, energy sources, raw materials, including oil, uh, th th these are very important still. Uh, in, in Chinese uh, attitudes, approach uh, towards the Middle Eastern countries. But in the post-COVID uh, environment, uh, we can see, uh, you know, vaccines uh, to, to uh, basically uh, play a very uh, different, uh, different game. Uh, already on, I mean, China was presenting itself to be uh, a source of, you know, technology transfer for these countries, uh, basically a country to help out, for instance, several Gulf countries uh, to change their economy from uh, a largely oil dependent uh, economy to diversify, uh, you know, uh, their domestic sources into, and human sources into, uh, let's say, a more technologically uh, driven uh, century. Uh, so China was already uh, helping out uh, in that aspect. So uh, vaccines may indeed change that uh, further uh, in, in China's favor, uh, especially in countries which already had a favorable uh, public perception uh, of China. But what would happen in countries that did not really have a favorable perception of China, such as Turkey? Uh, I mean, Turkish public surveys uh, tell us 
in general that uh, you know uh, anti-China sentiment in this country is quite substantial. Uh, although, of course, Turkey is also known for its uh, quite strong anti-Western, anti-NATO, anti-American uh, sentiment as well. So one may argue that this is not particularly uh, about China. But nevertheless, the anti-China sentiment in Turkey has its uh, deep historical, ideological, cultural uh, roots. Uh, and it's not something easy to erase. And uh, Chinese vaccine... Uh, when it was first being debated in Turkey in, uh, in November of uh, 2020, uh, it indeed had this very important potential uh, because first of all, it was understood uh, very soon that the, the price of the Chinese vaccine was not uh, cheap. So this was not a low quality uh, product. This was indeed a high end technological product uh, which was being sold uh, well, uh, equally, uh, in, in equal terms uh, with uh, the Western products, or even maybe a little bit more expensive than certain Western brands. So the price itself tells you something about quality, right, generally speaking. I mean, that, that's the public perception. Uh, and uh, basically, the initial reports uh, about the efficacy of the Chinese vaccine uh, was not bad. I mean, uh, very few uh, could argue that, you know, Chinese vaccines uh, were, were low quality and, uh, well, they did not really provide the scientific evidence uh, that would suggest that they are, they are working, they are indeed saving people from getting hospitalized or death even. Uh, so initially, at least, uh, it was, it had this potential to uh, save China's image, uh, to, to, to get it uh, to a better place. But in the Turkish case, at least, we can say that uh, there were so many hurdles. The efficacy reports wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be announced uh, because these vaccines were being tried in several different countries third phase uh, trials and their reports, their scientific, uh, you know, uh, evidence was coming from uh, many different countries and uh, that was not a coordinated job that was not well organized and uh, ultimately there were numbers uh, such as you know 50 percent 60 percent which suggested that uh, these vaccines were indeed uh, you know uh, they, they were not uh, as good as as efficient as uh, let's say certain Western brands, which you know uh, got around 90-95 percent of um, efficacy uh, ratings. Uh, so, uh, of course, scientific uh, aspect of this uh, study, the, the, all, all the number crunching and uh, you know statistical uh, measurements, etc., they are very much complex and uh, it's not uh, very easy handle uh, that kind of debate. But uh, what I'm getting at here is the public perception. Uh, and let's remind ourselves here that the Western media, uh, for the most part, was quite biased towards the, uh, you know, Chinese vaccine, whatever success, whatever uh, efficacy, uh, or whatever safety that they were uh, achieving, uh, we didn't really hear the good story uh, from, from Western media. Uh, whatever went wrong, whatever uh, was missing, whatever got, I don't know, mishandled, etc., we could immediately hear it, uh, you know, uh, from Western broadcasters, or uh, you could read them in the newspapers. Uh, the bribery, the corruption, etc., whatever past stories these you know companies had, uh, you could hear them and see them immediately. But the good story, the positive story, wouldn't fly. Uh, that also has to do with, of course, the ideological circumstances of the whole uh, global vaccine debate, global coronavirus uh, issue, uh, and also the, the larger politics of the new Cold War. Uh, in quotation marks. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, when we see the whole uh, vaccine debate, uh, you know, with regard to issues with regard to the delivery 
of the vaccine uh, because it was uh, belated in the Turkish case. Uh, we did not really get uh, the, the number of vaccines that we expected to get uh, in, in November or December of, of last year. Uh, the delivery was a problem. Efficacy reports did not uh, prove to be, uh, you know, uh, reaching the numbers uh, that was achieved by by certain Western uh, brands, uh, and uh, you know there was also uh, the the case for domestic polarization, of course, domestic polarization and the internal uh, political debate surrounding the Chinese vaccine, the pro government and the, the opposition circles. So the, this this kind of intense debate and criticism. Uh, with regard to uh, certain technical dimensions uh, of the vaccine debate, uh, at least in the Turkish case, uh, proved that uh, the vaccine as a soft power tool uh, or uh, as, as a tool for, you know, uh, getting back China's image uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as a tool to win over the masses around the world, uh, it's not going to be an easy job. It's going to be uh, a contentious uh, job uh, and uh, it needs to uh, handle a lot of uh, domestic hurdles uh, in order to achieve that.